Hello, uh, today I'm going to do something I've never done before. I'm going to try to preach on three chapters of Genesis, chapter 39, 40, and 41. Skipping chapter 38, you can read that on, on your own. One thing about 38 is that one of Jacob's sons, Judah, uh, is shown to be a very immoral man. And uh, that contrasts with chapter 39, where Joseph is shown to be a moral and pure man, even though that's not the main point of, of the Joseph story. Well, let's begin with prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Your word is holy and it is true. We pray that by your spirit, you would work in our hearts true repentance and faith in you through your son, Jesus. Amen. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, Genesis 39 begins with Joseph in Potiphar's house. Remember, his brothers uh, sold Joseph to slave traders, and these slave traders uh, in turn sold Joseph to a man named Potiphar, uh, who was an officer of Pharaoh, the captain of Pharaoh's guard. And uh, Potiphar puts him um, in charge of his house. Uh, we read in verse 2 of Genesis 39 uh, that the Lord was with Joseph and Joseph became successful. That's a recurring theme we're going to see again and again and again. Uh, Joseph was so successful working for Potiphar that Potiphar noticed. And he noticed whatever Joseph did uh, that it went really, really well. And so Joseph, I mean, Potiphar kept putting Joseph in charge of more and more things until he put Joseph in charge of everything in his house and in his fields. Uh, and uh, until uh, this is what happens in verse six. So that Potiphar left all that he had in Joseph's charge. And because of him, he had no concern about anything but the food he ate. That's how good of a, a a slave or servant Joseph was because the Lord blessed him. And, and really the Lord blessed Potiphar's house and all of his business dealings because of Joseph. Um, but then in, at the end of verse six, it says, now Joseph was handsome in form and appearance. And after a time, uh, Potiphar's wife uh, cast her eyes longingly with covetousness after Joseph and would say to him, uh, lie with me, come to bed with me. Uh, but Joseph refused. He was a man of integrity, right? Unlike Judah from the last chapter, he, he said, uh, you know, your husband, my master, has trusted me and he's put everything um, under my authority. The only thing he has withheld from me is, is you because you're his wife. How could I then do this great evil in sin against God? And, and Potiphar's wife kept on, you know, trying to uh, lure Joseph to bed with her, but, but Joseph finally just decided that he's not even going to be in the same room with this woman. But one day, um, it seems like Potiphar's wife put all this other servants out of the house and she gets Joseph alone and she, she caught him by his garment and she says, lie with me, come to bed with me. But Joseph left the garment in her hand and he fled away. But as soon as she did that, she came up with, with this plan. She called all the other servants, the other men of the house, in, into the house. And she said, look what this Hebrew servant has done. He, uh, he, he has come in to make sport of me. And, and, and she blames Joseph, really, of sexually assaulting her. And she, she hangs onto his garment and she waits until her husband Potiphar comes home. And she tells him this story about how Joseph uh, tried to assault her, but then she screamed. And when, when she screamed, Joseph got afraid and he ran out of the house, but he left uh, his garment in her hand. And so as soon as Potiphar heard this, uh, he became very angry and he put Joseph into prison into the very prison where the king's prisoners were confined. And so he is, is uh, suffering there. And what happens then is kind of interesting. Uh, the, the warden, uh, the keeper of the prison, notices something. He notices that the Lord was with Joseph. Just as he was with Joseph in Potiphar's house, the Lord was with Joseph in the prison. And he put Joseph in charge of all the other prisoners. And whatever happened in that prison, the prison warden put Joseph in charge of it. And verse 23 says, The keeper of the prison paid no attention to anything that was in Joseph's charge because the Lord was with him. And whatever he did, the Lord made it succeed. And so the same thing that happened in Potiphar's house is now happening in the prison. 
the leader uh, notices that the Lord is with Joseph and puts Joseph in charge of everything. But nonetheless, uh, Joseph, even though he's innocent, is suffering. That's one of the themes in the Joseph story. Uh, initially, although he was kind of arrogant with his brothers, probably shouldn't have bragged about that dream, um, he didn't deserve to get thrown into that pit and then sold into slavery. He was innocent of that. And here likewise, he's innocent of, of assaulting Potiphar's wife, but nonetheless, he gets blamed for it and he gets thrown into prison and he is suffering for it. And we notice at times throughout scripture that God allows his innocent servants to suffer. Um, like I was thinking of Job. Job didn't deserve all the things that happened to him, but, but God allowed him to suffer. Uh, God's prophet Jeremiah was once thrown into a pit um, and imprisoned under there uh, by the king because he was preaching God's word. And um, of course, uh, I, we also remember Paul. The apostle Paul was thrown in prison at various times uh, because of his ministry, because of preaching God's word. And Jesus uh, suffered because he was innocent. He never really was thrown in jail, but he was in custody, like when uh, the Jewish council was deliberating uh, what to do, or when Pilate was deliberating what to deliberating what to do. Jesus was another example of someone who was thrown in in prison, or at least in custody, although he was innocent. And so we'll continue on now uh, to, to what happens when Joseph is in prison. To chapter 40. And the big thing here is that Joseph interprets two dreams. In chapter 40, um, Pharaoh has a, a chief cupbearer and a chief baker, and they both offend him. And, and Pharaoh throws the cupbearer and the baker into prison, into the very prison where Joseph was kept and where Joseph was put in charge of a lot of stuff. And of course, the warden put these two prisoners, these new prisoners, under Joseph's charge. And one night, both the cupbearer and the baker have dreams, some very troubling dreams, and they have them on the same night. And, and they wake up and they look distraught, and Joseph asks them, well, what's troubling you? And, and they tell Joseph, well, we, we have this, we had this dream, um, but, but no one is able to interpret it for us. And, and Joseph said to them, do not interpretations belong to God? Tell them to me. And so here Joseph is giving glory to the one true God in, in the land of Egypt. He says, tell them to me. And so they each tell Joseph the dream they had. First, I'll start with the cupbearer's dream. The cupbearer dreamed that he saw a vine with three branches on it. And from these branches, well, they eventually blossomed and then they sprouted grapes. And the cupbearer took the grapes from, from the vine branches and he, uh, he squeezed the grapes into Pharaoh's cup, and he placed the cup in Pharaoh's hand. And Joseph said, this is the interpretation. The three branches represent, represent three days. In three days, Pharaoh is going to lift up your head, and he is going to restore you to your former position as his cupbearer. Okay? But, but then Joseph makes a, a request. He says, only, only this, remember me. When, you go, when it goes well with you, remember me to Pharaoh. Tell him about how, uh, how I've done nothing wrong and how I don't deserve to be in, in jail. And tell my story to Pharaoh. Only remember me, he says. And then the baker uh, tells Joseph his dream. And he tells Joseph, well, I dreamed that there were three baskets of bread on my head. I was carrying three baskets of bread. But the birds of the air kept eating, um, and, and by the way, the top basket was bread for Pharaoh, all sorts of baked goods for Pharaoh. But the birds of the air kept eating the baked goods out of that top basket. And Joseph said, here's the interpretation. The three baskets represent three days. And in three days, Pharaoh is going to lift up your head off of you. You will be hanged and the birds will eat your flesh. One thing I've noticed about Joseph is that he just tells people the dreams like it is. Even if it's going to be bad or if they don't like it, he just, he doesn't really have much tact when he's sharing that information. Okay? Um, and, and it happens. On the third day, three days from Joseph interpreting the dreams, Pharaoh is having a birthday feast and he uh, is in good spirits and, and, and he is, you know, doing things for different people and he lifts up the head of the cupbearer and he lifts up the head of the, the baker, but he restores the cupbearer to his position, but he hangs 
the baker, just as Joseph said would, ha would happen. And the very last verse of chapter 40 says this, Yet the cupbearer did not remember Joseph, but forgot him. And so again here, we see that God is allowing innocent Joseph to languish and to suffer in prison uh, for a long time, right? For a very long time. That, that takes us to chapter 41, where Pharaoh has a dream. <laughs> chapter 41 begins like this. After two whole years, Pharaoh dreamed. And that, now that is after two years of Joseph giving the interpretation to the cupbearer and to the baker. And my study Bible said that Joseph has now actually been in Egypt for somewhere between 12 and 13 years, either as a slave in Potiphar's house or as a prisoner in, in Pharaoh's prison. So he's, he's already been there over 12 years. And finally, Pharaoh dreamed that he was standing by the Nile. The, the first, he actually had two dreams. The first dream, he dreams that seven cows, uh, attractive and plump, came out of the Nile, and these were very uh, well-fed cows, and they were feeding in the reed grass. But then seven other cows came out of the Nile that were very ugly and thin. Pharaoh said, I've never seen such poor-looking cows in all of Egypt. And they came out of the Nile, and these seven thin, ugly cows ate up the seven attractive and plump cows. And then Pharaoh woke up. What a weird dream. And he falls asleep again, and he dreams again, and he dreams that there are there's one stalk growing, a stalk of grain, maybe it was corn, and he said there were seven ears of grain, plump and good, on this one stalk. And then, after that, seven more ears grew up that were very withered and thin and scorched by the east wind, and they grew up, and these seven uh, thin, scorched ears ate up the seven plump and good ears. And Pharaoh woke up and he was very troubled, right? Not by the fact that he had two dreams with a very similar theme. And so he called in all the magicians and all the wise men. And when the Bible says magicians, don't think of, uh, you know, the magicians you might see if you go to, um, to Branson or to Atlantic City. These, these aren't just illusionists. These are pagans. These are people who deal in the occult and, and they think they're you know, summoning their gods, but really there's demonic activity behind the kinds of things that these magicians do. So Pharaoh called the magicians and wise men and asked them to interpret these dreams, but they weren't able to. And the cupbearer must have overheard and known what's going on because he told Pharaoh, uh, Pharaoh, I remembered my faults today. I remembered something that I need to tell you. And the cupbearer tells Pharaoh about when he was imprisoned because he offended Pharaoh. And he and the baker had dreams, and he tells Pharaoh that, that each dream had a different interpretation, and there's a Hebrew man, a Hebrew slave in that prison, and he was able to interpret their dreams, and it turned out just as he said it would. The cupbearer was restored to his position, but the baker was hanged. And so right then, Pharaoh, he calls for Joseph and asks him to be brought to him. And so they do that very quickly. Uh, they make Joseph shave and put on a clean uh, outfit of clothes, and it says in verse 14 that they brought Joseph out of the pit. That's what they call the jail. It's the same Hebrew word that was used earlier when his brothers, uh, you know, wanted to kill him, but instead they threw him in the pit, and then they eventually sold him into slavery. Well, now he's taken out of the pit. My study Bible says, Joseph's 13 years of misery began by being thrown into a pit and ended by being brought out of one. Okay, and so Pharaoh tells Joseph, I've heard that you are one who is able to interpret dreams. And, and Joseph gives glory to God in verse 16. Joseph answered Pharaoh, he said, It is not in me. God will give Pharaoh a favorable answer. Or God will give uh, an answer to Pharaoh that, that will satisfy him. Right? So he's giving glory to God in the midst of a pagan nation, Egypt. That's a very good thing. It's same thing like he did when the... When the um, Cupbearer and the baker had their dream. He gave glory to God. Um, and then Joseph gives Pharaoh the interpretation. Um, he says, The seven good cows and the seven good ears of corn are, represent seven years. He says, Pharaoh, you had two dreams, but they mean the same thing. And here's what it means. The seven good cows, the plump fat cows, and the seven good fat ears represent seven years of plenty 
and abundance that, that Egypt will have, very fruitful years in Egypt, agriculturally speaking. But then the seven thin cows and the seven empty uh, scorched ears represent seven years of famine. And just how in the dream those seven thin cows ate up the seven fat cows, these seven years of famine will be so severe that no one will remem remember the years of abundance and plenty. That's how severe the famine is going to be. But, but not only does Joseph interpret these dreams, he then goes on to give Pharaoh advice about what to do. Uh, he says, uh, let Pharaoh uh, appoint a discerning and wise man and set him over all the land of Egypt. And, and here's what Pharaoh should do. Um, during the seven years of plenty, you need to save a lot of that grain. He said, save one-fifth of that grain. Put them in storehouses. Put them in granaries in all the cities of Egypt and save them so that we will have something to eat during the seven years of famine. Uh, this is how he concludes. The food, that food shall be a reserve for the land against the seven years of famine that are going to occur in the land of Egypt so that the land may not perish through the famine. Now, this advice and this proposal greatly pleased Pharaoh. And I want to read to you his reaction, starting in verse 38. And Pharaoh said to his servants, Can we find a man like this, in whom is the Spirit of God? Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, Since God has shown you all this, there is none so discerning and wise as you are. You shall be over my house, and all my people shall order themselves as you command. Only as regards the throne will I be greater than you. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, See, I have set you over all the land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh took his signet ring from his hand and, and put it on Joseph's hand, and clothed him in garments of fine linen, and put a gold chain about his neck. And he made him ride in his second chariot. And they called out before him, Bow the knee. Thus he set him over all the land of Egypt. Moreover, Pharaoh said to Joseph, I am Pharaoh, and without your consent, no one shall lift up hand or foot in all the land of Egypt. And so we see a pattern here, right? When Joseph was in Potiphar's house, Potiphar noticed that the Lord was with him, and he put him in charge of all of his house, although Joseph was still a slave. When he uh, got accused of assaulting that woman, uh, he got thrown in prison. And the prisoner, prison warden noticed that the Lord was with him and, and put Joseph in charge of everything that happened in the prison, although Joseph was still a prisoner. And now many years later, finally Pharaoh recognizes that the Lord is with Joseph and he puts Joseph in charge of all of Egypt. And he's no longer a prisoner and he's no longer a slave. He's the number two man in Egypt. Uh, this reminds me of what Christ said in, in one of the parables that... that um, you have been faithful over a little, therefore I will set you over much. Um, that, that's what happens uh, to Joseph in this story. Um, earlier, uh, Joseph you know, gave that interpretation to the cupbearer and said that in three days, uh, Pharaoh will lift up your head and restore you. Well, well, here now, God lifts up Joseph's head out of the pit and he exalts him to the highest position possible in all of Egypt. And so uh, Pharaoh puts him in charge of everything. And, and then starting in verse 46 and following, Joseph goes throughout all Egypt he, to all the cities and he gives them instructions and he puts people in charge of different cities and different fields. And he makes sure that they're going to store up grain um, in all the cities uh, during the seven years of abundance so that they'll be prepared for the famine. Also in this time, Joseph uh, gets married and he has two children uh, Ephraim and Manasseh. But I want to read to you now what happens during the seven years of famine, starting at verse 53. The seven years of plenty that occurred in the land of Egypt came to an end. And the seven years of famine began to come, as Joseph had said. There was famine in all lands, but in all the land of Egypt there was bread. When all the land of Egypt was famished, the people cried to Pharaoh for bread. Pharaoh said to all the Egyptians, Go to Joseph. What he says to you, do. So when the famine had spread over all the land, Joseph opened all the storehouses and sold to the Egyptians, for the famine was severe in the land of Egypt. Moreover, all the earth came to Egypt, to Joseph, to buy grain, because the famine was severe over all the earth. 
And here we should remember what God originally promised uh, to Abraham when he said, And in you and in your offspring shall all the families of the earth be blessed. And here it is that basically all the people of Egypt and the surrounding lands would have died if it weren't for Joseph, uh, one of the offspring of Abraham. They are indeed blessed through him. Um, and so in this story of Joseph, these three chapters, we see that Joseph was brought low to the very lowest pit to, in, in the prison. Uh, but after much time and suffering and languishing, God exalted him. Uh, and Pharaoh made him the number two man in all of Egypt. So Joseph was given the highest honor. We see that, that God allowed uh, Joseph to suffer even though he was innocent. And, and this had to be very puzzling for Joseph when he was languishing in prison. Uh, for years. Uh, he, he let him suffer before exalting him. And finally, we see that Joseph was God's instrument to bring about salvation uh, for Egyptians, for, for all the earth, and, and especially, as we'll come in, to see in later chapters, for, for the offspring of Abraham, for, for, for Joseph's brothers and for their families. And of course, uh, we need to talk about how this points to Jesus. I think Joseph is a great analogy of Jesus. Jesus is the ultimate example of someone who is innocent and who suffered. Pontius Pilate himself said, I find no guilt in this man. And when the centurion uh, saw the way Jesus died and saw the words that he said, he said, uh, certainly this man was innocent. In 1 Peter chapter 2, it says this of Christ, that he committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. We see that Jesus is the one who, who though innocent of all sin, suffered and died on our behalf for our salvation. Jesus was brought to the very lowest pit of all, to, to the cross, a place where, where only the scum of the earth, the earth and, and the worst criminals and slaves were sent to be executed and to suffer. That is how low Jesus, the innocent Son of God, uh, was, was sent to. But, but God exalted him, and he raised him from the dead, and, and he, he seated him at his own right hand and put, put everything under his feet. That is, everything that was under God the Father's charge, he has now given to Jesus. <laughs> put, put it all under his authority and exalted him. And really, Jesus is God's instrument of salvation. And it had to be through his suffering. It was through his suffering and through his death that Jesus atoned for all of our sin and that he defeated the devil and took away his power to accuse us of our sin. And through his resurrection, he guarantees eternal life for all who take refuge in Jesus and all who believe in him. And you know what? The, the story of Joseph also, in a way, shows what happens to Christians. Uh, what happened to Jesus is what happens to the body of Jesus, the body of Christ, which is the church. Like Christ, we also will suffer. Jesus says, just as they persecuted me, they will persecute you. Um, and sometimes God will allow you to suffer for reasons that you don't know. Um, and it will seem like a very, very long time, and you don't know what, what's happening. Um, but, but you know what? God just might be using you as his instrument to bring great blessing to others. Uh, he might make you languish in the pit for a long time. But will God one day bring you out of that pit <laughs> so long as you, you, you remain faithful to Christ? Well, well, listen to this, and I'll close with this from 1 Peter chapter 5. And after you have suffered for a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen.